What's cracking, ladies and gentlemen? 49 coming at you, another community shoutcast for the Join Dota Open League. We're loading into a best of two series between the Postman up against Risk Esports. Uh, Postman, I haven't actually casted either of them before. Risk Esports, I did cast a game of them up against the Arrow Catchers for the Samsung Cyber Gamer uh, Open League. So it will be interesting to see how they decide to play in the second game of cast for them. So, so far, Postman, first ban, Death Prophet coming out, and Risk Esports with a Lycanthrope ban coming out from them. Fairly unconventional ban, uh, fairly standard ban, sorry, coming out from both teams. As Lycanthrope, he's banned out due to how difficult it is to deal with them at all stages of the game, since while he is weak during the laning stage, if you ever lose a single team fight against the Lycanthrope, he's able to uh, punish your team quite heavily by taking towers very early on, because he's the far one of the fastest pushing uh, heroes in the game. Even the slightest advantage he turns massively in, into your favor, and it makes it very difficult to recover against the Lycanthrope, especially in the later stages of the game. And even if the Lycanthrope is playing significantly from behind, just due to the sheer amount of pushing presence he provides, he can actually turn at one side of the games into turnarounds. So we've got a Viper first pick coming up from the Postman, as they opt to ban out the Doombringer, but that in, of course gives away to Tinker over to Risk Esports. And so it's something very surprising that Postman opted not to ban out Tinker, especially considering the fact that uh, Radiant side do have first pick. So you usually never want to give away Tinker and a face of Void, especially over to the Radiant side. And so this is a twofold reason. And first of all, Tinker has a much easier access to the Ancients over on the Radiant side, especially as the mid lane. It means when he's going to check runes, he could also stack up Ancient Camps. And the Radiant uh, Ancients are much easier to defend than the Dire side Ancients as you've got more angles of approach to come in from, and because the tier 1 tower is right next to it, so you can respond a lot faster, Ten whereas the die uh, ancients, you, it takes you a lot longer to respond to them, and they've only and they've got a much easier gank path to come in. The other reason why you never want to give away Tinker to the Radiant side is because you have a much more strong, uh, powerful offlane. Because the Radiant offlane enjoys the advantage of having the Dire side hard camp close by, so if the uh, supports happen to go for a double pull through, it's easier to leech experience being done on the Radiant offlane, and it also means that you could control the creep equilibrium yourself by leeching uh, the hard camp towards the uh, creep wave. So the Radiant offlane for the face is Void. The reason why this works is Void's sole job is to create space for the Tinker while he spams out the March machines. So he time walks in, throws out the Chronosphere, Tinker spams out March, and if he's able to get two, three stacks of March going, you, your t the, team, the enemy team's forced to disengage. You can't fight into March, especially with if there's multiple instances of the March flying at the same time. And while well, uh, Postman have picked up Clockwork, and Clockwork's a great hero to hunt out the Tinker, because Clockwork's able to scout out Tinker when he uh, shift cues to blink into trees by using the Rocket Flare, he can then hookshot himself forward, and if he's able to catch out Tinker, he could kill him on his own at earlier levels, or later on if he's got if he has a teammate nearby, they could also come in to help pick him off. And the only way to really break high ground against a Tinker is to catch him outside of his base, and so he can't get the March Spam going by the time you try to knock on tier 3s. Or if he's inside the base, if you've got a uh, long range initiation, which the Clockwork can provide, if you could isolate him and quickly bring him down with some blink support coming in from the rest of your team, you, you then are able to successfully breach high ground. Otherwise, you want to pick up heroes that can uh, prevent Tinker from being able to utilize as much. So for instance, the Nyx Assassin with the carry pace, you walk into it, catch up the Tinker with the stun that you could choose to initiate. Or if you could outlast the March, so Juggernaut can be used against the Tinker in that 4 position role just for the, his healing ward. And so Postman, they've also banned out the Nature's Prophet as well as the Ancient Apparition. And that means that Skywrath Mage is available for Risk Esports as well as the Witch Doctor. So usually when the enemy team picks up a Faces Void, it forces you to have to pick up heroes uh, to ban heroes that work well with the Void, or to pick them up yourself. And so Skywrath Mage and Faces Void is a classic combo because it gives you such a huge increase in your pickoff power, and it means that Void's able to recover. So even if he's completely shut down in the offlane, and he's the lowest level on your team, so long as he has that Chronosphere, if the Skywrath Mage is around, you Chronos Phantom Mystic Flare that guarantees you a kill every single time you Chrono, and that enables the Faces Void to be able to recover. Since in that 3 position role, Faces Void isn't really going to be able to find much farm unless it's through kills. And so the Skywrath Mage helps set that up, and in this case, because Void is used almost entirely to help set up uh, Tinker by creating space for him, all Tinker deals damage, it's very difficult for the Postman to engage on Risk Esports, especially since Viper, he's a hero that relies on sustained DPS, similar to a Razor, while he's able to consistently output a huge amount of damage uh, through the Viper Strike, so that it gives him a lot of free shots in. He's not going to be provide immediate pickoff power, and so that means that the Tinker is going to guarantee to run around unmolested in these engagements. You've, you're immediately guaranteed to start a fight 4v5, because you've got the Chronos for Antimistic Black combination, and Postman, they're now forced to pick up heroes that can counteract the Void. And so they've got two of them so far, they've got the Vengeful Spirits, so you could swap out priority targets that are caught inside the Chronosphere, and so it means that Void has to catch up Venge uh, inside the Chronosphere, otherwise uh, Venge will be able to swap out whatever target he's caught in, and the Venge is more than happy to throw her life away if she could save, say, the Viper. 
or another core position hero. Viper works well against the Void, because if he's not caught in the Chronosphere, you can Viper Strike him and cripple his attack speed. And Void, the sole reason why you pick up Void in that offlane role is you catch a hero, you kill a hero in the Chronosphere. But with that Titan to pick up, looks like Risk Esports, they're actually going to be running a one position Void. And so Titan Hunter instead is going to be the offlane, and Titan Hunter works very well in the Radiant offlane, just because it's an easier offlane compared to the Dire Side, because you've got easy access to the hard camp. And because Titan Hunter is currently the most powerful offlane hero in the game, it's going to make a difficult situation even <laughs> worse, since Postman, they don't actually have enough damage to kill the Tide Hunter. Unless if it's Viper in that one position role going to be in that safe lane farmer, they don't have anyone that could lock down the Tide Hunter long enough for them to go for a kill. If it happens to be Tide v Clockwork, so if they decide to clash Ag try and have Clockwork over on the safe lane solo, then Tide Hunter actually walks all over him. Because with the Anchor Smash, he prevents uh, Clockwork from being able to take CS, as the melee hero is always going to get clipped by the Anchor Smash. And so it's the reason why Tide Hunter is usually bandle picks in almost every single game is because he has such a huge amount of uh, survivability in lane with the Anchor Smash as well as the Kraken Shell, you can't dislodge him from that lane. You're not going to have enough lockdown, Venge on their own, the Magic Missile, Titan to get shrug that off, especially if he's able to clip two or three heroes with the Anchor Smash, since the majority of damage coming out in the early stages of the game is going to be from uh, physical right clicks. And so Postman, they've decided to pick up the Earthshaker, and Earthshaker can actually give you a much higher chance of being a kill the Titan if you get a good fissure block in. But otherwise, Tide Hunter should actually have a fairly easy lane. And of course, the benefit of the Tide Hunter is similar to a Bat Rider. If you are able to completely zone him out and kill him a few times, he always has, he still has that comeback mechanic of being able to either go into the jungle, stack up camps and clear them out, or in Tide Hunter's case, he could actually go into Ancients. And so he probably doesn't want to in this case because you've got Tinker, and Tinker wants to uh, farm up the Ancients in order to guarantee his boots of travels. But Titan could always stack the camps for him if he happens to get completely zoned out. And so it means that they don't have to necessarily allocate supports to be able to stack out the Ancient Camp. And so it means that uh, Tinker and Titan can both recover by clearing out Ancients. So if Tinker has a very good mid lane, he could use the Ancients as a, a last influx of gold to be able to find his Boots of Travels, and Titan could get Leech Experience to find his Ravage. And so from Risk, they've banned out the Razor as well as the Shadow Shaman. And so these are heroes that work very well with the Void and also very well against the Void. Since the Faceless Void doesn't catch up the Razor, Razor could use his Link to zone Void out of his own Chronosphere. And because uh, Razor is tanky enough that even if Void catches him out in the Chronosphere, if Razor eventually gets tanky enough, he can even stay alive inside the Chronosphere unless the Mystic Flare is also committed. And then Razor can turn on the Faceless Void and go for a kill. And so Razor also is very difficult for the Tinker to deal with in lane. Just because he's able to zone them out quite handily at level 1 through to level 3. At least until Tinker gets 3 points up in March. Uh, the Razor should actually do fairly well. And because he's got the unstable current, Tinker can't afford to just spam out the laser without getting some kind of damage to return. So Witch Doctor now being banned out by the Postman as Risky Sports, the only hero they have to pick up now is another support. They instead go for Lich, and so the advantage of the Lich Skyrath Mage is Lich gives you the macro advantage, and so he could uh, either creep from the offlane or from the mid lane. Probably going to be from the offlane to ensure that Titan is able to pick up level 2. And so that provides you a huge amount of macro advantage by providing your supports more experience. And because Skyrath Mage is such a powerful support hero, in the sense that if he finds enough experience and enough farm, he essentially serves as another core hero in regard to the amount of uh, magic damage he's able to output. Lich does give you a huge amount of, uh, of macro advantage in the sense that your supports will be a lot richer than those. And so they decide to uh, counteract that by picking up a Kunker. And so Kunker works very well with the Clockwork and the Earthshaker, because you've got two heroes that can help pin people in place. Earthshaker can set this up with the uh, Aftershock, with his Echo Slam, and Clockwork can send him, can trap people in with his Cogs. You follow up the Ghost Boat, and if you do, and if you are able to unwind that combination, you can decisively win these engagements, just off the back of the Ghost Boat. And so Kunker also works well against the Void, because if he doesn't get caught out in the Chronosphere, all he has to do is throw the boat, and even if the boat completely whiffs, the Coco Rum uh, buff that applies to your allies, so that half the damage that you take will be completely mitigated, or will be deferred until the end of the Coco Rum duration, it, it means that the Faceless Void won't actually be able to kill a target inside the Chronosphere, or he'll need twice the amount of damage to kill a target, because he's 50% of that damage is going to get negated and will be non-lethal. And so it means that Void, he has to catch out the... Uh, the Kunkka, as well as the Vengeful Spirit, every single time he goes into the Chronosphere, he probably wants to catch out the uh, Viper as well as the maybe the Earthshaker, since they could also hinder him, but he absolutely has to catch out those two heroes. Otherwise, the Chronosphere uh, will be negated by the Ghost Boat, and will make it very difficult uh, for Risk Esports to be able to take the early advantage. But of course, if it comes to the late game, Risk have the vastly superior late game lineup, just because Tinker is, is one of the most powerful late game heroes in the game, since not only does he scale very well with items and with farm, he is also one of the few late game heroes that actually drags the game out to late game because he makes it so difficult for Postman to try to breach high ground. Just by spamming out March, 
If once he picks up a blink dagger, as long as he, if he's able to keep himself around here, spam out march to make it impossible for um, postman to either to, uh, breach high ground or to initiate on them without initiating into march. So even if Clockwork does hook shot into a uh, Kapiski, he's going to be sitting inside march two or three ticks, and if the rest of his team walk in as well, they're always going to be fighting much. So they're able to outlast the initial salvo of spells, postmen are at a significant disadvantage. So it looks like the Radiant offlane is going to be the one that the creep has been eating from, so Cubit going to be the offlaner over on that uh, tight enter, boots first as well as the safety ward, Kapeski going to be over on the tanker in that mid lane, it's a fairly standard build from him with the Null Talisman at two GG branches and being pulled two tangos. Bloodlock going to be the uh, four position Skyrath Mage, so the Skyrath Mage takes, usually takes farm priority over the uh, Lich, Although in this case, elusively could also function as a 4 because the Aghanim Sept upgrade on Lich with the Faces Void is actually quite potent since you're guaranteed to get multiple uh, bounces in if you catch more than one hero. And Gimli going to be the 1 position over in the Faces Void. Over for the boys and Postman, the Fudge going to be the 3 position Clockwork. Looks like he actually didn't start with a Safety Ward and Bloodlock's going to immediately start zoning him out. So with the Arcane Bolt, it's going to be very difficult for Clockwork to be able to stay in lane. But Clockwork, good recognition coming out from the Fudge, starting with another set of Tangos. And so the best way to deal with the Skyrath Mage is to outlast his uh, Mana Pool, since it's easier to get uh, HP sustained than it is to get Mana sustained. And so once Bloodlock tends to run low in Mana, you're just able to sit in lane. You can actually play very aggressively against him. So Bloodlock, but then again, he started with four Clarities. And so Fudge, while he was hoping to weather the storm, might be a lot more difficult to do so. In the mid lane, Mew, going up against Kapeski. And while Kunka's a very powerful mid hero, because Kepe he's a melee hero and because uh, Tinker can always spam out much, it's gonna, and because Tinker's a ranged hero, he has the intrinsic advantage of being a throw out cheeky right clicks on him, especially since he's got more. Uh, since uh, Kunka has such low base armor. But he's actually fairly low with uh, Mew. If Mew did land that torrent, could it actually look to go for a killer turn? But Kepeski actually opted to go for an early point in missile. And so Tinker usually has uh, two or three builds. You could go for the hybrid build, where you go for two points and lays and two points in March. And that's the build that you want to go for if you want to play a lot more defensively. But with that early point missile, I was able to find first blood. And so the advantage of this build is you can catch people by surprise. They usually don't expect Tinker to have a point in missile this early on. Since they usually expect you to have two points in laser. So if you do go for the hybrid build, where you go for two points in laser, then two points in missile, you could catch people by surprise and go for an easy kill. So Mew, playing really greedy there and being punished. And with that first blood going in Tinker, Sands looks like he's got his bottle flying up to him. And so Tanker, probably not going to be relying too heavily on the Ancients in this case, it's an extra in, a source of gold for him, but he doesn't necessarily need them. He can actually find his boots of travels in the lane, just because he's up against such a soft laning partner. Since Tinker against a melee hero, the laser spam in, is going to be enough to drive Kunk out of the lane. So every single time you goes into right click, as you saw there with the first blood attempt, lasers him so his right click actually missed, because he had that blind, and then threw out a few cheeky right clicks. And so once Tinker gets a few points out in March, Mew actually can't go anywhere near the creep wave. And so this is why Tinker is so powerful against melee heroes, and not only does he have the uh, range advantage so he can bully you with right clicks, once the March spam flies, you actually can't do anything. You're completely zoned out. Mew, I guess, can try to go for Torrent, but it looks like he's actually going for a fairly hard pub build. You usually see two points up in uh, Torrent to ensure that, and to uh, X marks to ensure the Torrent land. Looks like um, V Man Kai goes in over Kapeski, but Kapeski might actually get a kill with the missile he does. And so, uh, Postman actually some fall apart at the seams that haven't controlled the Tinker. In fact, they've done the opposite. They're feeding Tinker gold, and Tinker is the last hero you feed gold to. Just because he had, it's a critical window for him. You have about 15 minutes to try to kill Tinker as many times as possible before the Boots of Travels uh, comes online. Once the Boots of Travels comes online, Tinker, it's much more difficult to gank Tinker since he could simply just relocate to another lane. And you can beat everywhere at once, You've, it's very tricky to be able to uh, catch out the tanker. And once the blink dagger comes online, it's almost impossible. The only way they could catch out tanker at that point is with the Clockwork Goblin. The Venge, I suppose, with the uh, Wave of Terror, and with the Nether Swap, can try to set it up, but she's going to have to eat the march when she does so. So Kapeski in the mid lane, bottle crying now. He's just going to sit there mid and try to get as much farm as possible. And Postman will hand it to them. They at least had good, record, good sense enough to be able to place an aggressive ward here to be able to spot out the Ancients, so they know that if it's been stacked, they could try to contest them. But Kapeski so far hasn't gone for the bait. And Cubit, left alone with just the Earthshaker, because it's a Viper uh, in that safe lane, Titan is going to be having as easy times as you'd like. If it was any other uh, carry hero, if it was a, or a melee hero, Kunka, uh, Titan would actually be able to completely dominate this off lane. But because it's a Viper, Viper, even if he's not going to get caught by the Anchor Smash, and with the Poison Orb, should be able to uh, keep Cubit back and can actually go for a kill. Since while Kraken Shell will purge off CC, because you're constantly applying that snare, Cubit will get enough hits in that with another Toxin, he'll be able to uh, out-DPS the Titan Zone control in the lane. And so, uh, Utu for you, going to be the safe lane farmer over the Viper, most likely going to be the mech carrier for his team, since that's the advantage of drafting a Viper. All he really needs is survivability. Looks like Mew once again gets blown apart by Kapeski. 
Looks like we need a separate camera for him. Bloodlock actually rotated to provide the concussive shot. And uh, v -Man Kai actually caught out. Lots of great body blocks coming here from Lucidly. The fudge coming in actually cock blocks in uh, Bloodlock. But because he didn't catch out uh, Lucidly, there should be another kill going in favor of Risk. And the fudge backing himself off just cogs up on him. And both supports. So Penormous as well, rotating bot, not actually able to accomplish anything. And this Clockwork Goblin, level 1.5, compared that to Titus level 4. It's the power of the Radiant Offlane compared to the Dire Offlane. Because Bloodlock has completely zoned out Fudge, he can't do anything. And Clockwork Goblin, he's a very powerful offlane hero in the sense that if he catches a support hero out in the zone, he could go for a kill, but he needs at least one point up in Battery Assault to do that. And he can't do that against a Skyrath, and Skyrath's got enough mobility to stay outside of his cog range, and to constantly bully him back. So we've got a five and a half minute uh, hand of minus up on Gimli, son of Gloin. It looks like he is opting to max out the time lock. And with the hand of minus, because it provides such an uh, increase in attack speed, it's actually a very powerful uh, killing item on the Void. Since Void, you get more damage by stacking attack speed than you do by stacking uh, damage. And so it's why you usually see faces Voids go for a Maelstrom early on, why they go for a Mask and Bandus, is because time lock does double damage inside Chronosphere, you don't have to build damage. For the first 30 minutes, you can afford just to build attack speed, and you'll deal so much damage through your time lock, that that will give you enough uh, killing power, especially since you also have the pseudo CC coming in. So it looks like Fudge, five, six minutes into the game, finally able to pick up level two. Mew, going for a complete pub build, you usually see two points in X to guarantee the torrent. Because torrent's unreliable, and Kunkka's so heavily dependent on being able to land the torrent to set up the rest of his abilities, if you can't land the torrent, even if you're the best Kunkka player in the world, you never want to leave anything up to chance. Kepeski, realizing that his ancients might be stacked, so actually going into the uh, jungle camps, and so he's actually halfway towards his boots of travels six minutes into the game. If he's able to find a very timely uh, boots of travels at the rate that he's farming, we'll be finding it about the 10 11 minute mark. And if uh, postmen aren't able to do anything to punish him, it's no it now becomes very difficult for them to gank other lanes. The advantage of Tinker is while he's a very greedy mid, he also provides you a huge amount of pickoff power and a great amount of turnaround potential once the boots of travels comes online. Because you always have, similar to an, finding into Nature's Prophet, you always have to recount another hero. Especially if you choose to dive tower, you're going to be diving into a laser into a march. And Tinker, Kepeski actually going for a bit of an unconventional build, actually opting to max out laser, prioritize laser before missile. You usually see two points in laser before you max out missile, since missile is going to hit more targets, and laser means that you have to put yourself at risk. But we've got support now rotating in, v Kai as well as Panormus, starts in with the magic missile. Panormus goes in for the fissure block, does catch out Kepeski, but he's able to throw out the marsh machines. He's going to get one, he might actually even get two, as Panormus, no mind to follow up with another fissure. Ancients are now turning over Kepeski, they might actually bring him down. Mew completely whiffed the- it looks like he actually didn't commit with the torrent, it looks like the ghost boat whiffed. And so once again, Postman, unable to find a kill over in Tinker, and instead going the other way. So the extra point and laser really paying off there, since he was able to get the march off before they could uh, lock him down. So Mew, the Kunkka pickup isn't really going to be all too effective, Cubit's not rotating, he does have Ravage, so they could choose to expand this and want to go on him. But Elusively, just zoning him out instead. Elusively is level 5 compared to uh, the supports. So the Fudge level 3, so this is the macro advantage of the Lich coming into play because of the sacrifice, and because uh, PM, they picked up the Clockwork the over the Dire offlane, and because he was so handedly zoned out by Bloodlock, they can now afford to leave him alone against Gimli. Because Gimli can man fight him, he's got a Chronosphere, he could actually go for a solo kill in Fudge, if he ever overextends. Since the double time lock damage, so 140 magic damage per hit, and because it's pseudo random, it has a 25% chance to proc, you're guaranteed to get at least three uh, time lock procs in, in the duration of the current span. That's usually enough to bring a hero down, especially if you've also got supports rotating in. So elusively, looks like he's now stacking up camps. So he's stacking them up both for the Void, but mostly for the uh, Tanker, since Kapeski, he's the true one position. Void's there as a two to uh, provide lockdown. While his Void is a very powerful hard carry, he's got nothing in terms of burst damage potential to the Tanker. So Tanker, this game, probably going to be going through the Dagon build. The Sheepstick build used to be the standard build over on Tinker, but has fallen off just because Dagon, you can build it a lot earlier on, it gives you a lot more immediate impact. And in terms of late game potential, it, gives, it lets you start a fight 4v5, which is why you go for a Sheepstick, to start a fight 4v5. So Dagon gives you the exact same benefit, the end game result, and a fraction of the cost as well as providing a lot more early game impact. Beaming Kai gets called out by Bloodlock, and the Arcane Bolt does so much damage. He could actually go for a solo kill. If he had Mystic Flare, could have Mystic Flare up into the tree line and called him out. Penormous level 2, and Beaming Kai 2 as well. So the support's incredibly low, elusively. Over in the bottom lane, once again, they go for a kill, and they are able to catch him out. So it looks like Chronosphere was committed, and elusively will be picking up his Chain Frost very early on, especially with the Sacrifice experience kicking in. So it looks like the only saving grace for uh, Postman. He's going to be the uh, Viper, so Utu for you. He's going to be the mech carrier. We'll be having it in about two more minutes at the rate that he's farming. So once that mech comes online, Postman can look to try to go for these engagements, but by that point, it could be too late. Tinker already has his boots of travels up. 
So nine and a half minutes into the game, Tinker's got boots of travel, so that gives him the ability to now farm everywhere across the map and also to defend ganks or pushes coming in. So even though Tinker opted to prioritize laser over missile, he's still got enough ganking power that he can just rotate it, especially if the Chronos fan to guarantee the laser. So the reason why you usually see two points and laser on the Tinker is it's uh, because it's pure damage, the 160 pure damage is equivalent to 3 points in any other nuke. So for instance a Magnus with 3 points in Shockwave, because it's not pure damage, and because you've got the 25% magic resistance, the laser's are about as efficient as the Shockwave in regards to single target DPS. So it means you can opt to just keep it at 2 points, prioritize your other abilities, which in this case is going to be the March and the Missile, so they give you a lot more AoE impact. And then that gives you all the sustainability in the world. If you go for a more gank heavy tinker where you opt not to go for much, or you want to prioritize uh, early points on laser and missile, then maxing out laser makes a lot of sense just because it's 320 pure damage. So it does more DPS than a single target DPS than any other ability for its mana cost. But Kapaski will be picking up his Blink Dagger very early on, especially with the way that he's clearing out those jungle camps. Looks like Chain Frost was committed, wasn't able to pick off the fudge, but Utu for you. Rotating bot, Fissure Flies completely whiffs. And he's going to try to initiate with the Viper Striker over elusively, but the movement speed over Lich enables him to stay out of range of Utu for you. And Gimli, Chronosphere is coming off cooldown very shortly. While they don't have the Chain Frost, because Tinker can always rotate in at any time with the Boots of Travels, it makes it very difficult for Postman to try to take this tower. And so this is the power of the Tinker, especially since they weren't able to shut him down. In fact, they threw their lives away, continued to feed him gold. So Kapeski, he's going to be reaching the point of critical mass once that Blink Dagger comes online. Because the only hero that can try to catch him out reliably is going to be the Clockwork. And the Clockwork hookshots into Tinker, especially since the Fudge is so under farmed and so under leveled, he can just stand his ground and kill him. The laser will take out a third of his life, and if he's going to be fighting into the march, which he most likely will be, we'll be taking a fall. Fissure into Torrent Combo whiffs. Unfortunately, the biggest weakness of Fissure is you need a 3-4 points before it becomes effective as a, a setup spell, just because at level 1 and level 2, it's only going to last for a second. Looks like the aggressive ward, unfortunately a bit too close to the tower, so it's also dewarded. So Postman, everything's going wrong for them, and now you've got Tinker coming in. So Kapeski, you're going to spam out March, and Postman, they have to back off now. Even if they do get a fantastic initiation in, because they're fighting into March, they're always guaranteed to lose at least one hero. Because their supports are level 3, actually it looks like they haven't even hit level 3 yet, they're going to be taking a fall to fight into March. Utu for you, it's the laser, as well, the uh, missile, as well as the a uh, concussive shot, both flies completely whiffs, Gimli's hiding in the wings, he's got Chronosphere available, he can actually choose to jump you as well as Utu for you, he goes in the stand the back line, catches out 3, Veeming Kai 360, will be taken 4, Kapeski unfortunately runs into the Chronosphere, lasers the fudge, takes out almost all his life, mech flies and Kapeski actually has put himself in a very bad situation, he's so close off his blink dagger with Tidehunter, actually hasn't rotated and doesn't actually have enough mana to rotate, they're able to find at least one kill off the back of that, and Postman, because they expanded their mech, because they expanded their ghost boat, they can no longer fight as 5, so they're going to force, be forced to back off, especially with Tide now potentially rotating in. So Blink Dagger's online for both Tide Hunter and the Tinker around the same time, so 12 minutes in. Tinker's now hit the point of critical mass, so the only hero that could have hoped to try to pick him off is going to be the Clockwork, and Clockwork can't do that, because A, he doesn't even have Hookshot, and even if he did, because he's always going to be uh, Hookshotting into at least one stack of March, the Laser and Missile will be enough to be the killer. Laser immediately flies over Mew, so Kapeski revealing his Blink Dagger, Torrent flies, but I don't think Muse actually landed any Torrent so far. Throws out the Ghost Bow as well. That might latch, never mind. Completely whiffs. And Kapeski just toying with him. And with that Blink Dagger, now going to be going towards the uh, Dagon, so the Null Talisman that he started off with translates into the Dagon. So that's the added advantage of the Dagon build over in the Tinker, is it makes good use of your starting items, so you're effectively not wasting any gold. So now we've got a set of Arcane Orb, a uh, Arcane Boots up on the Sky Wrath Mage, and so he's got enough mana speed to use the entire combo. Gimli? actually get scouted out by Vivinkai as they reveal themselves, but the supports are level 3. So they actually can't do anything. Gimli, even if they do get a good stun in, Gimli can just stand his ground and smack him down. So it's opted to go to max out Time Walk second. You usually see 2 points in Time Walk because it's the most efficient point uh, over in the Time Walk because it gives you an, enough initiation range that you can initiate from outside of their vision range at night time. Of course, having more points in Time Walk does make a lot of sense just because it makes it a lot easier for you to set up a good Chronosphere. And so you usually see uh, Faces Void players leave Backtrack until they max out the other two. Or in some cases even completely forego backtrack for maxing for early points in time walk as well as uh, time lock. Bloodlocks waiting in the wings, well that Mystic Flake can instantly kill Veeming Kai if you catch them out with some kind of CC setup. So if elusively or if a uh, Bloodlock is able to catch him out the concussive shot, should be enough damage to really bring him down. Kapeski playing very far forward. Cubit actually tried to TP out. Looks like Ravage was expanded but wasn't able to result in any kills. Kapeski should be able to make it out. And Mew, he's got the X mark so finally he should be able to land the torrent. First throw in the game, landed about 14 minutes, and it should be a bring down Cubit. But Tidehunter, he's making it tough for them. With a Kraken shell, 
It takes three of them rotating in. Looks like they're entire actually four heroes rotated. Mid just be to pick off one kill on Tide. Uh, while Cuba completely looks like he whiffed that Ravage and he wasn't able to translate that into a kill. Postman are able to uh, finally get themselves on the scoreboard and find that kill. And with that, they can you look to uh, try to capitalize because their ultimates are up. And Risk Esports, they don't have the Ravage, and the Ravage is absolutely uh, essential for them to try to take these fights decisively. But it looks like uh, Kapeski will be finding his Dagon in about three more minutes, the rate that he's farming, assuming he doesn't get a kill or, a t or any tower gold. And so once that Dagon comes online, he could instantly kill Viminkai or Panormus at the start of every fight. With a laser missile, as well as the Dagon, should be enough to instantly pop the Venge. Might not be to pop the uh, Earthshaker, but it will keep him at low enough HP that's forced back. Especially with a little bit of assistance coming in from Bloodlock. Rocket Flare being used, and it actually looks like uh, Kapeski starting playing a little bit safe. He doesn't want to die until he has his Dagon. Actually, he hasn't died at all, so there's a fat stack of Spree Gold up on him. And Utu for you, in this game, probably wants to go for... You usually want to go for an Aghanim Scepter and a Viper, but in this case, because you're fighting against a tanker that's going to have Dagon so early on, and because you're up against a, a Tide Hunter, you want to go for a BKB. Gimli, looks like Hookshot actually flies over in Bloodlock, and the FUD should be to clean him up. Gimli throws out Chronosphere, catches out two, but he didn't catch out Utu. And Cubit, because he doesn't have Chronos uh, Ravage, he actually can't contest this. So he is able to TP himself on out. The Chain Force flies, but not going to be enough damage to be able to uh, bring down the fudge. And Postman, they actually are reacting fairly well. Looks like the Ghost Boy is going to catch up in Kapeski. And Kapeski takes a huge amount of damage. Actually, it's going to be enough for a kill. And Viminkai finally finds a revenge. And Cubit, this is because he whiffed that uh, Ravage early on and wasn't able to translate that into a kill because they have that timing window. If Ravage was online, Postman would have at least suffered uh, two or three losses there. As you look at how low their heroes are. So Postman, good recognition coming here from them. Choosing to capitalize when uh, Risk Esports don't have their Ravage online. And Bloodlock is going to be taking another death. He throws out the Mystic Flare, so from Hell's Heart he stabs at thee. That's not going to be enough in Cubit. He actually does. So he's able to smack him down, but he throws his own life away as well. And so Risk Esports starting to throw a bit, running in one at a time. They're going for trades and Postman. Because they're behind, any trade is a good trade when you're playing from behind. And so they're now actually able to recover quite nicely from their a fairly poor early game. Since Earthstrike was able to pick up level 6 off that, and so was the Venge. And so now the supports have effectively come online because they have their ultimates to work with. And so Postman, signs of life being shown. We now have two points up in the X marks to guarantee the uh, Torrent over for Kunkka. For some uh, mid players like Mushi, they actually offer three points in March, and the rationale for that is you it guarantees the Ghost Boat. And in terms of burst damage potential, if you guarantee the Ghost Boat, you're going to deal more damage than guaranteeing the Torrent. So that means that you X marks immediately throw the Ghost Boat, and then once they get hit by the boat, then you Torrent them as opposed to X marking them, torrenting, and then following up with the Ghost Boat. The uh, 3 points in X combo gives you a lot more burst DPS, and it's usually a lot more reliable. Because the Ghost Boat also means that if supports rotate in, they're also going to be rotating into the Ghost Boat. And so it makes it very difficult for them to uh, try to engage you on that front. But that being said, 2 points on Ghost Boat does give you a lot more uh, reliability, since it gives you the uh, torrent setup, so it's a lot more mana efficient, and it means that you can ex get uh, more points over in the... Uh, Tidebringer, so it gives you a lot more lane control. Gimli pops the Musk and Madness, goes over an Utu, hasn't actually used his Chrono Spear, doesn't have an off cooldown yet. And Utu actually stands his ground, he threw out the Viper Strike, so Gimli actually choosing to commit with the Viper Strike, with the uh, Chrono Spear, but the Mystic Player is enough to bring him down. And Gimli with the X Marks should be taking it forward. Magic Missile from Vimming Kai is going to be there. Bloodlog, Ancient Seals, Penovus to prevent the Echo Slam. Cubit comes in, he throws out Ravage, catches out three, huge Ravage coming up from him. Mew, he's got the Coco Arm debuffs, so keeping him alive for now. And the fire checks, it looks like he kills elusively over in the background. Panormus, though, should be taking a fall. One more Arcane Bolt, not even needed. Arcane Bolt's a creep instead. Cubit, he's now caught in with the creep wave. So Fudge is actually doing a lot of work. While that happens, Kapeski, he walks into the fray. He's a little bit late, but he's got the laser as well as the uh, missile to be able to clean up the Fudge. So that should be enough with the missile. Looks like he actually doesn't have enough. Blinking himself forward. And he might actually be able to keep himself alive. So the Fudge, there we go, the missile's there. So Kapeski is finally able to bring him down. And that's his Dagon. Actually, will be his Dagon too if he's able to find a few more creeps. And so Kapeski, without a Dagon, able to find three kills rotating in. So this is the power of the tanker, similar to a Nature's Prophet. Every single time you go in for an engagement, you have to assume another hero is going to be there. There's the invisible presence of the tanker, similar to the invisible presence of the Nature's Prophet. And so it makes it very difficult for you to get these clean getaways. You're always going to be training. And if you consider the fact that Risk have the superior late game lineup because they've got the tanker and because they've got the void, compared to uh, Postman, whose only real source of late game is going to be the Viper, since Kunko, while he's a, he's a potent uh, hero in regards to the damage that he outputs, because he's such a fragile hero, even though he's a strength hero, because he has such low armor, and because it looks like he's actually going for a Shadow Blade, he's not going to have en enough survivability to ever get off more than one Tidebringer. Especially if he gets called out in the Chronosphere, he's going to die every single time. And if he's not able to run into a fight with a Coco Run buff, Tinker can actually instantly kill him at the start of a fight. And so it's the intrinsic weakness of a Titan of a uh, Kunko is you need to draft two other cores that can pick up the slack. So it's usually having something that can Elder Titan, 
uh, helps out a lot because you've got the Earth Splitter to also go on top of the Ghost Boat, so it gives you a lot more teamfight presence. Or picking up a, a hard carry of your own, like having a Faceless Void of your own would be good. Or something like an Ember Spirit that could transition to the late game. And so because they don't, re the only uh, hero that really scales all too well to the late stage of the game is going to be Viper, and even then, Viper's a core that only can outcarry the enemy core if he's ahead. Who too good dives into the trees for Cubit, immediately just blinks on out there. There's toying with him, looks like he's going for a very aggressive time to build, so opting to prioritize Gush over Max and Krakenshaw. The advantage of, of this build is it gives you a lot more aggressive capability since you've got more damage from the Gush and more armor reduction. But you you do usually see a uh, maxed out Krakenshaw build in time, so it means that if he gets locked down, you're gonna be able to ensure the uh, Ravjalot earlier on. And you he gets a kill over in Bloodlock, but should be taking falls. So the time looks like that Gimli throws out the Chronosphere, and Penormus is also caught in the Chain Frost now flies. Unfortunately, Penormus died before the Chain Frost could bounce. And the TP looks like it was complete, it was cancelled as well, so they should be gonna take that tier one. And that's a Dagon 3 gonna be coming online for Tinker very shortly, especially the tier one tower taking a fall. So they do trade uh, tier 1 for tier 1, but the mid lane tier 1 opens up the map a lot more. The, safe, the uh, Radiant safe lane tier 1 does open up uh, access to the maps, and it means that in terms of map control, they now have this much, as opposed to uh, having this much that they had before, because it's a lot more difficult to react, so that means that the safe lane, you can only really farm it if it's pushed up to around there, and even then, you need a ward there. And so the safe, taking out the uh, safe lane tier 1 does free up a huge amount of map, but because postmen are always going to be fighting into tanker, it's really difficult for them to capitalize on this, just because the support rotations early on were so completely unsuccessful. And Kapeski with a Dagon level 3, he's going to make it very difficult for them to uh, go into these engagements. They're always going to be taking at least two deaths, just due to the tanker. So one from the march, one from the laser, he goes on and Vimming Climb, brings him down, Fudge completely dodges the uh, hookshot, he does eat the Viper Strike, and that's going to be his death. So Kapeski, unfortunately my friend, he's got no other way to bail himself out. A fudge eats that Frost Blast, but it's more than happy to take that as he ends a huge spree, so he gets about 840 gold from that, so he's going to be blown towards a 4 staff. And the advantage of the 4 staff is when you're against the melee core, like a face of void, you hookshot, cog him, and you 4 staff yourself out. So it's the Bulba build, because the idea is you can't man fight against that core if you're stuck inside the cogs. Since if you do so, you'll die. Unless you have a blade mail very early on, you can't do that. And because the fudge is playing so far from behind, you instead use the cogs as a temporary prison. That's a form of pseudo CC to control Gimli, especially if he's already time warped. So a good recognition coming up from him. You can also use it to uh, help set up the cog. You can push heroes into cog and push yourself out to give yourself a lot more mobility. But what is that? That ghost boat completely whiffs. Mystic flare, quite despair, enough to be able to bring. Now Ravage flies, catches up too. And Penormus should be taking fall there as you two. He's able to pop mech to keep himself alive. Penormus wants to go for the Echo Slam. Not going to do it as Bloodlock cutting around. Cubit now caught in a bad position. He's going to throw in an Echo Smash before he dies. Never mind, not able to do so. Bloodlock unfortunately puts himself a bit too far forward. So Postman, despite being put on the back foot, they are able to capitalize. And that all boils down to the fact that Kapeski was dead. If Kapeski was there, they would be able to find at least one kill from that. Just because you have to uh, always keep in mind the laser Dagon combo. And Kapeski, he finds one. Then can kind of just catch him out the stun. That might actually be enough to be able to bring down some as elusively doesn't have any uh, mana to really work with. Throws out the march. So ensures that uh, if they try to commit to this, they will be taken for Mew. He actually could be dying here if he's inside the march elusively. Doesn't have enough for the uh, Frost Blast, and he's going to be forced back. He actually throws out one more right click and get Mew, but the same thing goes for him. And so both of them decide to call a truce and back off. And Kapaski, once again, over committing, he should at least wait until he gets his Ghost Scepter before going in like that. Since otherwise, if you blink into their entire team, when the rest of your team is dead, you can't really capitalize with the Dagon. So you, you might be able to kill one, maybe even two, but you're inevitably going to be taken to fall. And that trade's gonna work out in favor of Postman. We've now got a, a 23 minute Molnir up on the Faces Void. And so Molnir, one, the most cost efficient DPS source for the Faces Void. Since as a DPS item in general, just in terms of gold for damage, Molnir and Desolate are the two best uh, DPS items you could get if, if in regards to bang for your buck. Since Molnir, if you look at just single target DPS, if their armor value is above 10, it does more single target DPS than the Daedalus and then the, and then the MKV, assuming they don't have evasion. And that's just single target DPS, so it's completely discounting the AoE impact of the lightning bounces, which hits up to 7 targets, or the static storm. So Molnir hands down, it's, a, it's probably one of the best DPS items you could get, in terms of value for money. And on the hero like a void that has damage intrinsically built in, uh, from the, through the time lock, so you don't even need to build damage on him. Building attack speed gives you more damage than actually building damage. And so Gimli, in terms of his DPS potential, is absolutely through the roof. 305 attack speed, so he's actually got almost max attack speed when he pops that Mask of Madness. So that means that he should actually even be able to kill 2-3 targets inside the Chronosphere, if he gets a multi-hero Chronosphere, since you're also accounting for the Lightning procs. And the Static Storm buff, he can actually throw it over on Kapeski to make it difficult for them to uh, turn on him. Actually playing very aggressively, pops Mask of Madness, and then walks himself forward. 
Kapeski looks like he's actually going to be maxing out the Dagon. So not going for the Excalibur, but actually opted to go for three points in Rearm very early on. This is actually a bit of a mistake. You usually don't want to go for a third point in Rearm until you have another Mystic uh, Staff. And Kapeski actually takes a fall. He's called out with the Ghost Scepter. Throws out the uh, Dagon over a Mew, but because the Coco Run buff is on him, they're able to do it. And Postman are standing their ground. Fudge caught up with the Mystic Flare, but he's able to keep himself alive with, by breaking cogs. Ravages fly, but Ravages too, like, Crane falls an offline back and forth. It does bring down Beaming Kai, but Mew is able to absorb it to prevent it from continuing to proc. Gimli cleans up the fudge in the background. He's got Chronosphere! He can actually go in solo and try to catch out three. He does! He goes and he's going to run YouTube. The Lightning procs are doing their work. He gets one, he gets two, he gets three. This is the power of the Molnir on the face is void. And Gimli is the glowing. He swings left and right and brings them down. So that fight went absolutely terribly for Risk Esports. Kapeski was caught out the start of a fight, wasn't even able to get a kill before he died because the Coco Run buff was on, and because he got caught out by the uh, X Marks Ghost Boat. The Ravage flew out, wasn't actually, they weren't really able to capitalize off the Ravage too much because the only thing, uh, hero they had alive to really work with was Elusively, since Gimli was uh, hanging back in the rings. If he also came in immediately, they might have recovered a lot better. And so, even though there was such a terrible fight, because the Molnir came online so early for Gimli, and because he got that three man Chronosphere, he was able to turn it. Otherwise, Postman would have, should have actually decisively won that engagement. As they baited out a Ravage way too late, they needed to Ravage the instant they went on Kapeski. But Qubit wasn't able to respond. So the even though uh, Risk Esports aren't really executing their draft effectively, because Gimli is so farmed, and because he's got that Mol he got that Molnir so early on, he's just able to snow uh, tear through Postman on his own. And so the way that Risk Esports want to take these engagements is either Gimli or the uh, Qubit are able to blink in and start a fight with either the Ravage or with the Chronosphere. The advantage of the Titan is he could also counter-initiate, or for whatever instance, if Kapeski decides to blink forward and start a fight by killing someone, then when they turn on him, Cuba comes in, throws out the Ravage, and then Gimli comes and wipes it out as well. So Kapeski, he has that uh, blank check of being able to play very aggressively and blinking very far forward because he knows his teammates are able to bail him out. Still disagreeing with uh, going for the third point in Riyam, you usually see two points in Riyam at this point, or even one point if you're going for the Excalibur build, where you want to be as efficient as possible with your mana. Because the three points in Riyam, you don't have the mana pool to work with it. You want to go for the third point in Riyam and you've got about at least 1500 mana. Because otherwise, you're only getting two Riyam cycles off in the fight. And even then, you're not going to be able to use every single ability. So you're actually getting about one and a half Riyam cycles, although you get two if you include Soul Ring Regen. And Tinker's all about um, maximizing his rearm cycle to be as efficient as possible, like a Storm Spirit. Your mana pool is everything. You translate your mana pool into damage, you translate it into survivability. And for Tinker, if you're not able to uh, make good use of it, if you're not being as efficient as possible, it really starts to affect your impact. Gimli comes in over a mute, then <laughs> Vimin Kai's there catching them out the stun. Looks like he actually backtracked that. Throws out a Chronos on three once again. Now the Chain Frost is there! It's an absolute disaster for Postman. Vimin Kai, four stars out by Pudge, but should be taking a fall. And Fudge, and Mew, he's actually a uh, ghost off, he is, he's actually keeping himself alive with the uh, Shadow Blade. But Cupid can actually just throw out casual Anchor Smash, and that might actually be enough to be able to bring him down. As the Shadow Blade does wear off, he's going to TP himself on out, and Cupid unfortunately doesn't have it yet, throws it to Ravage, so committing a lot of resources for that kill. I was about to say, he's not, he doesn't have enough to be able to bring him down, or to interrupt him, but choosing to commit the Ravage, more than happy to do so, as that kill could actually translate into a lot of, into a, the tier 2 tower. Since the only hero they have to be worried about is the, t is the uh, Kunker, and Kunker is dead for 50 seconds. Unless he's willing to expand buyback, which he doesn't actually have, so they're going to lose two towers. So the tier 1 of the bottom lane takes 4, and they're going to be losing that tier 2. And Gimli, 6k gold up on him. He can buy a butterfly outright if he wants to, or most, if he wants to go for a safer build, probably going for a BKB. And that means that the backline supports can't do anything, so Gimli can YOLO in even without a Chrono Span kill them all. Looks like Panormus is actually able to catch out Kapeski. So Kapeski really playing a bit too far forward, started to throw his lead a bit. But he's buying space, so hashtag space created as they decide to smack on their tier 3. Take about half his life off before they back off. And Bloodlock, looks like he might be going for a Yule Scepter, it could just be a casual Sage's Mask. Would have preferred something like a Rod of Valley up on him, especially because Skyrath Mage needs survivability from the Vitality Booster. And the Rod of Valley Mame ensures that you're able to get a good Mystic Flare off. And so Viper did opt to go for the Aghanim Scepter. The Aghanim Scepter is a great pickup on Viper. He's probably one of the best Aghanim Scepter upgrade heroes in the game, just because Viper is such a slow hero, and the 950 range of the Viper Strike ensures that you could initiate all enemy targets and pin them in place. Since the 12 second cooldown is absolutely ridiculous in these drawn out fights, you're guaranteed to get at least two off. And every single time you Viper Strike someone, they're effectively, if they don't have any kind of mobility, uh, ability like a blink or a four star, they're dead in the water. 
But the drawback to this is that means that every single fight, he actually could be torn apart by the Ravage as well as the Mystic Flare. And so that's the added advantage of Risk. As well as the fact that uh, Tinker can just walk in and, and once that E-Blade comes online, just shotgun Viper down. So Viper, you usually don't want to go for BKB unless you absolutely have to, but when there's an enemy Tinker and an enemy Tidehunter, you're forced to go for that BKB, just to ensure that you you don't get caught out by the Ravage. Because if you get caught out by the Ravage with the lineup that Risky Sports have, there's a very strong chance you're going to get completely wiped. Kapeski eats the Ghost Boat, Fisher flies, and they should be able to bring him down. Mew, good recognition coming up from him. He actually chose to hit a creep, as the uh, Tidebringer cleave damage is calculated off the base armor of the unit that you hit. And because creeps have such low armor, hitting a creep will deal more overall damage. Because the Tidebringer crits 100%, then hitting the hero, then hitting a hero. And so Kapeski really started to throw a lot. He's been taking, he's taken a lot of unnecessary deaths. And because he opted for three points of rearm, he's not going to be as effective as he'd like. And while the argument behind going for the th third point of rearm this early on means that you could rearm a lot earlier and throw out more Dagon charges, because you don't have to monopole to sustain it, you're still only going to get the same amount of uh, team fight contribution as if you went for two points. Only if you went for two points, it at least give you an extra set of heat-seeking missiles or an extra march that you could potentially throw out. And so Kapeski really sounded to misplay a bit. Cubit blinks forward and actually catches himself in bad position. It looks like Postman completely baited that. And Cubit, unfortunately, the Fissure is blocking out Utu for you. Ghostboat flies actually going to catch out the backline supports. Never mind, they're just barely able to juke it out. Hookshot flies up from the fudge, hits his teammate, now falls up himself and catches out Bloodlock, but the Chronosphere flies over on two, and Utu for you, should actually be taking death. The Coco Rum is there, so it's keeping them alive for as long as possible. The Veeming Kai, four up himself into the tree line. Mystic Flare being used, catches out Utu, the Time Lock is there to be able to lock him down. And Mew, he doesn't have enough mana Shadow Blade, and that's going to be his death. As Cubit comes in, the Echo Slam's there from Panormus, he's standing this, he gets two huge plays coming up from Panormus. And he sacrifices left to ensure that Mew's able to get himself on out there. He's got enough mana now that he could uh, Shadow Blade out. But he's got a BKB up over in the Kunko. And so you usually see uh, Kunko go for uh, something like Shadow, uh, Shadow Blade has kind of fallen in favor. You do see Kunko's actually just rush the Daedalus as soon early as possible. Then maybe pick up something like a Blink Dagger. Because you can X marks yourself, Blink Forward, hit the creep, and then immediately torrent yourself, uh, X marks yourself out. So you can use that to defend high ground pushes. All the slow siege. The BKB does give you the ability to just run into these fights and to disregard the Titan So it's a forced BKB pickup over in the Kunko. Especially since there's also a tank on the field. But because Gimli doesn't give a damn about the BKB, it's still going to be very difficult. Although that being said, because the majority of his damage is actually coming out from uh, the Time Lock Magic Damage and the Molnir Prox, BKB actually does make a lot of sense in this game. And so Panormus looks like he does have a Blink Dagger, was actually able to use that to great effect. And the advantage of the Earthshaker is that he could jump on your backline supports and control them fairly effectively. Since Earthshaker, just off the back of his Aftershock, if you stagger it perfectly, you've got 4.5 seconds of stun time, just because of Aftershock. And because he's got that maxed out, Panormus is a, if Earthshaker is a very powerful uh, support hero because he scales so well to all stages of the game, and because he provides you a lot of brainless crowd control. Since he can throw himself his life away, he can just blink into a team fight, throw out the Echo Slam, and use it to counter-initiate when they clump, and then try to turn the tide. And Postman, they're now smoked up, they might actually catch out Bloodlock, as he's completely on his own. Jam being picked up by Elusively, so they want to use that to try to rest the map control. Utu for you, does catch up Bloodlock, Magic Missile flies, and the Viper trying to guarantee the kill. And the Fudge, looks like he's just able to smack him down. And to risk, what I was talking about them being so far ahead with uh, Kapeski hitting Critical Mass so early on, his item progression, he got a uh, Dagon 5 very late. And most likely going to be going for the Ghost Scepter because he opted to upgrade his Dagon as opposed to going for the uh, early Ghost Scepter pickup. His survivability is questionable and because he's taken so many unnecessary deaths, the tanker pickup's going to take a lot longer for it to come online. Especially since you've always got the Coco Rum debuff to work with. So it means that if you don't Chronosphere Mew, it's going to be very dif difficult for you to be able to uh, try to take these fights just because the fact that ha half your damage is going to be negated. And when you're a team that's reliant on that Alpha Strike advantage of being able to front load all your damage in the first 4 or 5 seconds of a fight and try to kill enough of their heroes that they're forced to try to disengage, it becomes difficult for Risk. So every single time Gimli doesn't catch Mew in that Chronosphere, or every single time Mew is able to Ghost Boat before he, the Chronosphere flies or when the Chronosphere flies, Postman have a very powerful chance to turn the fight around. But if you take a look at net worth, Gimli actually two times the net worth of uh, Mew. And so Mew really uh, taking a fall over in terms of net worth, just because in the mid lane he wasn't actually able to find any kills in that mid lane. He fed two deaths over to Kapeski, and because he opted for the pub build of maxing out Tide Hunter, uh, the Tidebringer as well as the Torrent, and wasn't actually even able to successfully land any, really uh, working against him. That's the reason why you see two points in X, or even three points. 
is you never want to uh, rely on chance, you never want to rely on the enemy player misplaying, you want to make things as guaranteed as possible. And so it's why you usually don't see which Doctor picked up, unless you've got another hero at center as well, with the Mimikoi on the Chronosphere. And Gimli should be to bring him down in time, actually never mind, the swap is there from Vimikai. Ravage flies, catches up, Therese and Fudge isn't able to initiate. Panormus wants to go for the Echo Slam, throws out the Fissure, but the rest of his team is dead, there's no point. Fudge throws out a cheeky flare, he's got Hookshot to use defensively. But Kapeski, he's on the hunt, throws out Missile over on the Fudge. Fudge has got his uh, Hookshot available, so he's able to use it over the Panormus. So Panormus then still didn't ensure that he can get the disengage, but Gimli, that's not your base, he's get called out with a fish, he's actually got 11.4k gold, so he's got enough to buy a Divine right here, and almost enough to be able to finish a uh, Butterfly. Looks like he actually went for a Bloodstone, so Gimli, starting to glowing, really starting to just play with the food. Ghostbow flies, but he immediately eats the Mystic Flare. Ghostbow actually lands on elusively, but Mew gets smacked down by Kapeski, he's able to laser him down. So Kapeski's actually completely out of mind. now he's forced back to base. So this is the weakness of the uh, early point in, in Rearm, is you're going to be going back to base a lot more, so you're not going to be as efficient with the amount of pool. And elusively, one more right click's able to bring down Phenomus. So that tier 2 should be taking a fall. If we take a quick look at Golden Experience, 25,000 experience lead in favor of Risk Esports, and 20,000 uh, gold lead. So Risk, despite the throws coming up from them, because they're so far ahead, it's difficult for Postman to try to recover, especially since their draft favored the mid game. Postman's draft is all about taking these decisive mid-game engagements by initiating it with the hookshot, following up with the ghost boat if you're able to catch up one or two heroes, and then trying to take a fight off that. They don't have to line up for dragging the game out late, and Fudge actually could have chosen to hookshot the creeps there since it's an AoE stun that would have actually caught out the tide, but choosing not to do so. And Kapeski just find another kill over in Beaming Kai, so just tinker things, especially once the Dagon 5 is online. Looks like he's actually foregoing the Eid lane, going for a Sheepstick. And so, because he's picked up the Mystic uh, staff, this is usually the point where you pick up Rearm level 3. Because you've got enough mana now that you could get 3.5 Rearm cycles before you run out of mana. If you go for a uh, level 3 Rearm without any other mana boosting items, with just the Dagon 5, you've got 1.5, maybe 2 Rearm cycles before you completely dry. And that drastically impacts your uh, team fighting capabilities. Since Tinker, he, you're actually there to provide all the damage. Gimli, he can provide damage because he's got so much farm. But really, his sole job is his job is just to lock him down in place for Tinker to be able to go in and blow people up. And Void actually picked up an E-Blade, so he's going to be the one providing that shotgun. So just the straight up bad mana plays coming up from Gimli as he's making a statement, going in for these unconventional pickups. Bloodstone and E-Blade, you never want to go for these items on Void since E-Blade disarms you when you go in. In terms of theory crafting, on a hero like a Spectre, E-Blade actually can be a fairly cost effective pickup if you're playing a Spectre from behind against another enemy core because the 4D Agi translates well to your illusions and because I believe the uh, Desolate doesn't count if you're a disarmed since Desolate, the only thing it keeps in, that Desolate keeps in mind is if they're uh, away from other units so I th I'm not 100% certain on this but I think you still get Desolate procs from your right click as well so e on Spectre can be picked up, it's a very unconventional pickup but it can be used as a, a pickup if you're playing from behind against a significantly farmed enemy core since you also have that burst damage to work with. But the advantage of Void picking up the E-Blade doesn't mean that you've got a shotgun that doesn't require Tinker to go for one. Veeming Kai swaps him out and the Fisher flies. So Veeming Kai will be taking four, but it guarantees the Ghost Boat. And Ghost Boat does catch out Cubit, but he's got Ravage as well as the Kraken Shell. They're going over on Gimli, but Gimli's actually incredibly tanky, so the Bloodstone doing work. The Ravage catches out Utu for you, and he's actually immediately popped his mech. Mew, his TP's on the cell now then. Viper Strike is there over on Cubit, he actually could be taking a fall. But Kapeski's there to follow up. And Gimli just runs past the tier 2 tower and starts smacking on Utu. Echo Slam being used on 1, not going to be enough though, so the Bloodstone really actually doing wonders to keep him alive. And so they are able to find that kill. And that tier 2 should be taking a fall. Especially with no buyback available for Postman. So Cubit looks like he winds up being the mech carrier for a team, so that's the added advantage of the Tidehunter. Is in some lineups he actually can choose not to even go for an early blink and go for a mech. The Cubit wanted to guarantee the early blink target to get good ravages off. But in this case, because you've got Gimli to start these fights, Cubit didn't even necessarily have to go for a blink. If they want to fight early, and if they had a lot of faith in Gimli, they actually could have opted to go for an early mech as opposed to an early blink on him, and let Gimli start these fights. And so the advantage of that is because Postman has a lineup that were looking to fight early, it gives you a lot more a team fight in Pettis with the a mech to counteract their mech. But because they were so far ahead, Going for the Blink Dagger that early on does give you a huge amount of team fighting presence as well if you can start a fight with a good Ravage, and also gives you that counter-initiation capability. So Kapaski, 
actually gets called out with the, with the uh, X marks and the Ghost Boat should actually land on him. But uh, Gimli does catch out too with the Chronos Fan. But the Coco Rom doing a huge amount of work to keep him alive. Keep it now comes in. Doesn't have the Ravage, but the uh, Chain Fossil flying back and forth. Utu for you. Actually, with the Ancient Seal, it's going to clean him up. And Mr. Clez there. The Fudge gets lasered down by Kapeski. Reminds me of a bit of a joke. Why is Dagon called Dagon? Because Dagon. And Mew Mew, they've had enough. They call GG, so 39 minutes in. Risk decisively take game number one up against the Postman. So this is the best of two series. I'll be taking a quick break, and we should be right back for game number two. Stay tuned.